I'm, my uh, focus today is on the central control of uh, much of what they just talked about. So that the sort of the brainstem control of everything. So what I'm going to do is, we'll just see here if I can get through here. These are the objectives I want to cover today. Uh, modern stressors, I won't touch too much on that because we all experience that every day, plus um, patients that come into your offices as well experience that daily. Um, as I mentioned, the central regulation of adrenal fatigue, and <clears throat> Dr. Edwards talked about how adrenal fatigue is sort of um, a catch-all phrase. Um, obviously, there are different stages, so I'd like to talk a little bit about that as well. The neuroendocrine connection, methods for assessing the central control, as well as clinical examples, and then just a brief um, bit of therapeutic interventions. Dr. Edwards and Dr. Heyman very eloquently talked about what they use in their practice. I am a researcher. Uh, I'm not a clinician, although I'm a clinician wannabe. So I love coming to these conferences to take in the information that you have every day with your patients and then turn that into uh, more cutting edge research to help with what you do in your offices. This, I'm not sure if many of you have seen this before. This is sort of that, that a pictorial um, diagram of the nervous system, the immune system, and the endocrine system. And what we have here is, I'm not sure how to do the, the laser pointer, but in the very center, you'll see the nervous system. I put that there for a reason. The nervous system <clears throat> oftentimes is, um, um, as Dr. Heyman had mentioned, very much involved in things such as immune regulation as well as endocrine regulation. But I put it in the center as it, as it uh, more often than not, is more of that control mechanism. The immune system and the endocrine system play equally important roles, but we tend to see that that nervous system very much calls the shots. So I put that into, in the center for a reason. Now any type of imbalances in one system out of the three that you see definitely need, leads to imbalances in the other. Now this may not necessarily be in acute situations, but most certainly in chronic situations. So I've put that there in the center. And um, many times we liken it to the conductor in an orchestra. Um, that conductor keeps everything in control, so if the strings are getting a little bit louder than they should be, that conductor makes sure that they, tamp they, they dampen that down. If percussion, for example, seems to be getting a little bit out of control, that, co that conductor can come in and bring that down as well. So both up and down. So modern life leads to neuroendoimmune imbalances. Now, when I was taught uh, biology uh, a number of years ago, we were taught in compartments, so that the, the neurological compartment, the endocrinological compartment, and then, of course, the immune compartment. And we were taught them as separate entities. Now, oftentimes, it's the easiest way to learn something, but if you really want to understand a biological system, we have to see these three particular systems as one functioning unit. And I'm sure um, this weekend definitely uh, hammered that, that uh, message home that the neuroendoimmune systems really function together. This is not separate entities that we're dealing with. When one is out of balance, as I mentioned a couple slides previously, the others very much become out of balance. So uh, Dr. Uh, Heyman had mentioned about that crosstalk, that communication. Every single moment as we sit here right now, that communication is ongoing. So whether or not your body is fighting perhaps a, um, a flu that you may not even feel, your immune system is taking care of that, but it's also communicating to your nervous system and as well to your endocrine system of what's going on. So it's really important that that communication stays, um, stays current and is always, always searching to make sure that that body stays in a homeostatic um, uh, stasis, homeostatic state. <clears throat> so these are just a couple. I, I briefly outlined some of the different types of stressors, and you'll find out in, in a few slides why this is important. But mental stress is definitely something that we all face. Multitasking in our jobs, um, rapid and easy access to anything new. That may sound a little bit strange to think of that as a stressor, but in fact, I'm not sure of, of any of you, and I have no shares in Apple at all, but how many of you have seen the new iPad that's out? Have, have any of you used it? 
Okay, so getting, getting used to that newer technology, although it's an adjunct to what's already available, getting used to that newer technology and applying it properly, that can add a little bit of stress to the situation as well. Emotional stress. Uh, for example, breakdown of social structures, the pressure to perform. That's not something at all that we in this room deal with, I'm sure, but that is, part, that is definitely part of the uh, emotional stress response, as well as monotonous work, uh, PTSD, and some of the traumatic events that are out there. Physical stress, uh, uh, lifestyle, <laughs> a sedative lifestyle. There was a picture that I had on here before in another talk, it was a picture of um, a vehicle, the back end of a vehicle driving down the road and a dog running beside the vehicle and a leash coming outside the window. So the person was walking their dog but actually driving instead. So very much that type of lifestyle can add to our physical stress as well as unhappy, unhappy, unhappy and unhealthy eating habits and of course our polluted environment. So stressors result in the imbalances in the nervous system, the immune system, and the endocrine system. And each of these particular systems working in concert with one another, as I, as I mentioned earlier, have their own communicating molecules. So of course we know in the endocrine system it's very much hormonally driven. In the nervous system, neurotransmitters are the key communicators. And um, in the immune system, cytokines are. Now, obviously there are other uh, molecules in each of the systems, but these are the key uh, communicating molecules that we, that we um, can measure and that we use every day for this communication and homeostasis. So this is a really interesting diagram that I wanted to include. I wanted to use this to look at the effects of stressors on various um, systems. If you see on the left hand side, it's a little bit, hopefully it's a little bit easier to see, maybe it's not quite in focus, but you'll see psychological root causes and the whole idea in, in being able to help a patient is getting to those root causes. So on the left hand side, I've listed a couple. Um, it's certainly not exhaustive, but for example, traumatic stress, mental stress and emotional stress. What we tend to see is we tend to see the nervous system being the first um, system to really um, be affected. And as I mentioned, oftentimes the nervous system will run the show. This is one of those um, case in points. When the nervous system is upregulated, it releases neurotransmitters. That release of neurotransmitters, of course, communicates with the immune and the endocrine system. In communicating with these two systems, they in turn will release their own communicating molecules.